we are going to talk about this idea of an inverse and I want to first talk about what an inverse is, what it does kind of in a general context. And so uh, remember that the multiplicative inverse, so the multiplicative inverse or reciprocal of a number, say seven is one seven, or maybe you could write that as seven to the negative first power. The actual definition of this is that one over seven times seven is equal to one, or seven times one seventh is again equal to one. N by N matrix A is called invertible. If there's a matrix C such that CA equals I and AC equals I. Let me make sure you're seeing the connection. So here's this one seventh, it's taking the place of that C, except for we're gonna be talking about matrices. And so to show that something is invertible, we need to, at least in the beginning, we need to find some other item C and multiply on both sides showing that things work. Why both sides? Because remember that yesterday we learned that with matrices, that the order matters because in general, in general, we get that AC does not equal CA, but sometimes it does. So here we're going to call C the inverse of A, and we want to know that whether C is unique. So I'm gonna do a little proof to show that C is unique. So here's my claim. the inverse of A, call it C, is unique. Here's my proof. In this case, I will start with uh, the word suppose. This is what's called a uniqueness proof and uniqueness proofs always kind of start the same way. So we're, we're talking about this idea of unique. That means that there's only one so if you want to prove that something is unique, you sort of suppose that it's not unique and see what happens. Suppose uh, there are two inverses. Suppose there are two inverses B and C of matrix A. Let's, so it's unique. And so when I say that there are two, oh, I'm missing a word, am I not, sorry, two inverses. So this bit right here is basically saying that they're not unique. And we'll get a contradiction is what we're gonna do. So if I have two uh, inverses, I could start with one. If I started with matrix B, I could multiply the matrix B by I, which is the identity matrix. And uh, we could write I a lot of different ways, but notice that one way we could write I is as AC. So I've got, here's my I, and I'm gonna write it as AC. Why can I write it as AC? Why is I equal to AC? From Felix, from Seche, from Juan, because I is equal to AC from up above, right? Because they're inverse matrices. So now I can reassociate. So this tells me that I've got B times A, all times C. Just move the parentheses around. And then what can you tell me about B times A? What is B times A? From Felix, from Abed, from Richard, Seche that B times A here is also equal to I because B is also an inverse and IC is equal to what? Just C because the identity matrix times anything would just be whatever that anything was. So notice what we're saying. We are saying that B is equal to C. But we suppose that there were two different inverses and we just learned that B was equal to C. So golly, that must mean sort of like a contradiction. So 
So therefore, we have that the inverse is unique. So you have this unique inverse. There's a unique inverse. We don't want to call it C or B or any of those things. So since there's a unique inverse, we'll give it its own symbol. We're going to cleverly call it A inverse. It's probably going to blow your mind. So there's one example of a negative exponent, but it doesn't re really mean negative exponent in the same way. So a matrix that is not invertible is called a singular matrix. Uh, while a matrix that is invertible is called non-singular. There's a lot of this class where we're just learning different names for the same thing. So not invertible, singular. Singular, singular means not invertible. A non-singular means invertible. So it's a different first word for it. All right, so let's see how all this stuff works. So if we want to verify that this matrix C here is the inverse of A, that it's actually A inverse, then what we're going to do is we're going to find AC and we're going to find CA. So we're going to multiply it on both sides and just verify that it works. What should we get when we multiply these two things together? if it is indeed the inverse from Felix, Gerald, Seche, Richard, Twi, Kevin, we should get uh, not quite one, but we should get I, we should get I. Negative two times negative five, 10 minus nine is one, six minus six is zero, minus 15 plus 15, zero, minus nine plus 10, one. So here you get I. Go the other direction or in CA, negative 15 plus 15 is zero, negative six plus six is zero, negative nine plus 10 is one. So we get I again. So this tells us therefore our C is equal to I inverse. All right, so theorem four is, is nice. It's like the two by two version. And this is the only one of these formulas that you're gonna get that's worth memorizing. So it says that if you have A being A, B, C, D, and if A, D minus B, C, um, is not equal to zero. What I want to point out here is the A and the D are on the diagonal and the B and the C, kind of the off diagonal, the reverse diagonal. This thing right here, you might also recognize as a determinant if you've, if you've done that in other classes. So if A is A, B, C, D, and if A, D minus B, C isn't zero, then A is invertible. And the formula for A inverse is this nice one right here. I would probably recommend that you memorize this. Not because it's like super important, but it'll just save you some time. And in particular, what you'll notice is that the A's and D's that these guys right here are gonna switch, All right? So you had AD and now you have a DA. Let me see if I can write that more clearly. So notice, that these guys are switching. And then notice that the signs are changing on the B and the C, and that you're dividing the whole thing by one over the determinant. And from Abed asked, does this formula only work for two by two matrices? Yeah, this is only for two by two. So like I said, the value of AD minus BC is called the determinant. Theorem four is basically stating that A inverse exists if and only if the determinant of A doesn't equal zero. And this will actually be true for all dimensions. So let's just do a quick example with this. So if I want to find the inverse of A, and my A that I'm going to work with is 3, negative 7, 2, 5, then I need to find my inverse or my determinant of A. So that's going to be got what? 15 minus minus 14. What were my colors? I think that one's the yellow one. And I think I had that one as orange. This minus sign here is built into the formula. 
So that will be, according to my careful calculations, that'll be 29. So we're saying that A inverse will be equal to one over 29. Here's that 29 showing up there. And then the yellow ones change place. So I had a three and a five, now I'll have a five and a three. And the orange ones change sign. So now I'll have a plus seven and a minus two. Or if you want to write the whole thing out, I guess you could say it five over 29, seven over 29, While you write this, I asked a question back at the very beginning of class about code switching and it didn't look like anyone was saying yes. So code switching is, it, it could apply to a lot of things, but most often it's in the context of race. So it'd be if you're, be the context where it oftentimes comes up is when um, if you're, if you're black, you're going to you're black, but you're in a white environment, then you're going to change the way you talk or you're Asian and the way you talk around your Asian friends would be different than the way you talk around your about around your white friends or your black friends or something like that, that you're code switching. You're having to sort of like translate who you are into a different um, a different way of of speaking or talking to feel like you could fit in with whatever the group is that you're in. I mean, um, Kyle's probably right that it's probably also happening with multilingual people. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you from for Abe. He said he's heard it described as like flipping a switch with multilanguage. We could talk about it more later, but I asked the question and then it hadn't followed up and just remembered that. So that's that's what it is. I, I think we probably all do this to some extent. I mean, the way I talk to you is different. Oh, well, the, the fires are back. The way I talk to you is different than the way I talk to my children or to my uh to my wife or something like that so i mean there is there is some of this happening for all of us but uh sometimes it can be uh lead people to have to sort of put on a mask or not be their authentic self in certain settings and that can be tough so let's keep going theorem five if A is an invertible n by n matrix, then for each B in R n, the equation AX equals B has a unique solution, X equals A, uh, A inverse times B. And so there's sort of two parts of this proof. This is an example of what's called a, an existence and uniqueness proof. We've already done uniqueness proofs. Uh, we just did one earlier today. So if you're doing a uniqueness proof, then the general concept is that you as assume that things are not unique. And then to do an, uh, an existence proof, Basically, you have to show that there is a solution. Show at least one instance uh, just to be clear, you don't have to find it. You just have to show there is one. As long as you can find one, then you know the solution exists. And then in the uniqueness part, you're going to show that it couldn't be the same. So in the if and only if proofs, oftentimes we showed it left to right and then later showed it right to left. In an existence and uniqueness proof, we'll show the existence and then we'll show the uniqueness. It's also kind of a two-step proof. So here is our proof. So let's start with the existence. I'm showing the existence part here first. I want to let some stuff be given. So I've got let B in Rn and invertible A, which is N by N, be given. Okay. 
And so what I'm trying to show is that there is a solution to AX equals B. Um, so I wanna solve AX equals B and show that AX B equals B has, ooh, that's, um, and show that it has a solution. This is an N by N. Whew. So I've got AX equals B. Notice that we're saying that A is invertible. So since A is invertible, what matrix do you know exists? If A is invertible, we know which matrix exists. A inverse, exactly. So we can whack both, both sides of this uh, equation with an A inverse. So I have A inverse times AX equals A inverse B. So notice what I'm doing here. I hit both sides with an A inverse. Okay. And what is A inverse times A? I've got lots of I's. This is telling me that IX equals A inverse B, which would be the same thing as telling me that um, X is equal to A inverse B. Okay. In other words, uh, AX equals B has a solution. namely x equals a inverse b. Thanks Felix, Sangun, Megumi, Tommy, Gerald, Richard, Twee, and Ratana for uh, helping me out earlier. Okay, so we were trying to show existence. We just showed you existence. Now we got to show uniqueness. So to show uniqueness, just like we've talked about, we assume that there's two of something and see how it works out. So we say, suppose that U and V uh, in Rn are solutions to AX equals B. Okay. So if there's solutions to AX equals B, this is telling us that A times U equals B and A times V equals B. Or in other words, is telling us that AU equals AV equals B. Okay. Now think about what we're trying to show. What we're trying to show is that U equals B and right at this line, you can see a place where you see U's and V's on two sides of an equal sign. But the problem is, is that those A's are in the way. So what do you know of, what could we do to try to get rid of that A that's there on the left side? So we could, from sung -hoon, from Ben, from Kyle, from Ratana, uh, from a whole bunch, we could multiply both sides by the inverse. So I could take A inverse times AU must be equal to A inverse times AV must be equal to A inverse B. But this tells me A inverse times A is I, I times U is just U. A inverse times AV is just IV or V. And we just showed that U equals V. Hmm. 
So what we have going. So you know, what are we saying here? We're saying therefore u equals v and the solution is unique. If you back up, we're doing a proof that involves existence and uniqueness. We've completed both parts. And so right here at the very end, we can do a big old happy QED because we finished both parts of the proof. Okay. Questions? All right, so let's just apply this uh, quickly. So if you're trying to solve a system, and so here's, here's the system that I'm trying to solve right here. And I wanna use this inverse concept. What I do is I recognize that I, I could write all that stuff as A minus two minus three, three, five times X equals five, negative seven. And so what we just learned is if we can find the inverse, we learned that X will be equal to A inverse times five minus seven. And I think we already found this inverse earlier. This is the same example. Oh, I think I, and I, and I list it here. So this would be minus five, minus three, three, two times five minus seven. Minus 25 plus 21 minus four. Fifteen minus 14 is one. So we found, uh, notice that what we did was we found the solution to the system. Solution with the inverse, which is kind of cool. Prior to this, we could only do it with row reduction. Questions? So for the inverse part, mm -hmm. like uh, this week from five to two, it's like uh, A to D, right? Uh, yes, yes. Here you had... Like, uh... mm -hmm. But like when, when we speak like the sign, like negative sign, it not go with the five, it's just stay over there. Good. Give me a second. Oh yeah, good question. Uh, because the determinant, what's the determinant here? So it would be minus two times five minus minus three times three, which is what? Which is the minus one. 
So that one, the one over the determinant part, that's why all those signs were changing. Does that make sense, Ratana? Cool, good question. All right, very good. So let's, let's keep going. So this next theorem has three little proofs. And for these proofs, I'm gonna, I'd like these to be honors videos. Um, so for those of you that are doing honors, maybe that's Felix or Kyle or anyone else that wants to join, there's three different ones. If you wanna prove these three, the proofs are in my notes already. You don't have to make them up yourself. But in terms of presenting them and walking through them and explaining them, those would make for some some nice videos. Here's here's what the the three little parts say. The first one basically says if you inverse an inverse, you get back where you started. Should be obvious. The third one says that the inverse of a transpose is the transpose of the inverse. We're not going to really play with transposes for a couple more chapters. So by the time we need this, we'll have forgotten it and we'll come back to it. I'm not too worried about that one. But this middle one is the important one. And we will be spending a fair amount of time using this concept later on. And the key is that um, if, you, if you think about it, if you distribute the inverse, then you're going to reverse the order of the two matrices. So notice here you have A on the left, and here you have A on the right. Um, I'm, one of your classmates can prove this for the honors video, or you can see this in my notes, but this is going to be important when we talk about linear transformations in, in a sub subsequent chapter. So that's why this is going to become a big deal. Okay. Questions? Uh, Bestie, do you only do that for the inverse, right? Uh, when you distribute the exponent, the inverse to both sides, you switch the order. <laughs> Correct. And I think we did something, there was something interesting that happened when we did it with transposes as well, as I recall. Um, so in general, you can't just switch. You, in general, the orders matter. You got to be very careful. But this is a place where we know how to distribute that exponent in, or that inversing in. So good question. All right. So from what we just, just did, you can do a little bit of extrapolating. So think about it this way. If you had like A, B, C, D inverse, then how would you be able to unpack that whole thing? So you could distribute and what would happen to the order? What would be the new order? Um, I would start with D, C, B, A. Yeah, D, C, B, A, all inverse. Okay. All right, there's, there's some nice theory here, but I wanna make sure that you track how to find an inverse. So you're like, we've been talking about them. We know how to find them if they're two by two. What if it's not two by two? And so let's jump straight down to example four here. So if we wanna find an inverse, we use row reduction. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a, a, a matrix like this, an augmented matrix. One, two, three, two, five, four, one, negative one, 10. And then I'm gonna augment with the identity matrix. One, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. Okay. So when you row reduce this, which you, you can do this on your calculator, when you row reduce this on your calculator, you're going to get one zero 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 one zero 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 one on the left. And on the right, you're going to get, um, I did this in advance in my notes. So you're gonna get 54, negative 23, 
negative 7, negative 16, 7, 2, negative 3, 3, 1. Okay. And what I want to comment on is that this bit over here, here's your A matrix. And so we started in the form A augmented with I. And we're saying when we row reduce, this is going to be equal to I augmented with A inverse. Um, Dusty, you said negative seven, but you wrote negative three. Uh, good call. Thank you for that. This one. Thank you for that. Okay. And so this matrix over here on the right side, this is your A inverse. So making sure you're, you're seeing that. So we're saying, so A inverse would be equal to 54, oh my gosh, 54, minus 23, that thing there. Okay. And this method is going to work whether you have a, this would work with a two by two matrix. This would work with a three by three matrix. This would work with an N by N matrix. Okay. The, it only fails. So there's no inverse. If you do this process, and you end up with not I. So this part right here, yeah. come on. if you end up with not I here, then that meant there was no inverse, meant the original matrix was singular. So thanks everyone for an amazingly warm reception today. Like the, your, your attitudes and your heart and your, the substance of your question has just been blazing hot. And I just appreciate all of that. Um, oh, oh yeah. You guys have been warm too. So um, as well as the atmosphere. Uh, We will talk about how to do this in the calculator tomorrow when we pick this up, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, so thanks everyone for this idea of an inverse. You now have just about everything that you need to be successful in this section. We'll just pick up a couple of loose ends at the beginning of class tomorrow. Um, in the meantime, have a wonderful day. Feel free to hang on if you have questions. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow uh, when maybe Bernie will be back. Uh, Take care, everyone. So just to reiterate, Dusty, there can only be zero or one inverses for a matrix, correct? There's, yeah, there's either no inverse or there is an inverse. And if there is an inverse, it's unique, which is like what see. you just said. Okay. Yeah, Thank good you. question, Abe. Yeah, other questions? Um, Dusty, there was a question on uh, homework. Uh, so we had a matrix A and then uh, uh, there was a matrix A times B, which, which there was and it asked to find the matrix B. And I don't know like what, how I should start that problem. Like, It was just find the B so that the product is zero? Uh, no, the, the product is uh, uh, a number. So uh, I can share a screen and show is you. Is it number seven by any chance? 
Uh, I think it's number seven, yeah. I'm actually doing honors video and I'm actually going to be putting it up uh, probably in the next two minutes. So there's that if you need it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And there he answered my question. So Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. Nice timing. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Does that work for you, Abed, to just watch uh, Kyle's video? Uh, yes. Yes, that will work. And you know where to find those videos? Uh, yeah, it's on your website. Right? Yeah. Yep. 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 Awesome. Other questions? Alex, Calvin, Carlene, Regan, or Regan? Awesome. 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 Cool. Uh, Thank you for being here. Go ahead. I, uh, I put my question in the chat, but I, I was wondering why we have formulas for the inverse, mm -hmm. if we can just row reduce. Yep. Good question. The hmm. We have a formula for the two by two. Um, and the reason we have the formula is because they come up often enough that we'd rather not have to put them in our calculator. Like it, we can do it, we can do it by hand and in our head faster than we can type it into a calculator, basically. Because um, right. on your calculator, you're like, go to the matrix edit menu, type in your matrix, go back to the home screen, choose the REF command, go back to the name menu. You're like going back and forth a whole bunch of times. So it's just kind of clodgy. Uh, beyond the uh, beyond the two by two, we will definitely just row reduce. So did that answer okay. your question, so, Alex? So, so basically we should just memorize the two by two formula? Me memorize the two by two and then use the calculator for anything bigger than two by two. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool, any other questions? Uh, not for me. Uh, have a good day. Awesome. Awesome. See you tomorrow. Take care.